Hey guys, I just want to spend a few minutes here tying up some loose ends before the uh, AP test on energy. Uh, and that's about cars because you saw, I had you watch some videos about uh, car safety features uh, that make them safer in accidents that soak up energy uh, in collisions to protect the occupants. And part of those videos was uh, braking distance and how braking distance varies with, uh, with speed. So I wanna go over that a little bit and then also talk a little bit about acceleration. So the question we have here is do cars behave strangely? Cars are very familiar objects to us, but when we think about it, sometimes it's enlightening to think about why they do things that they do. So we'll look at braking distance and the way that they accelerate. Okay, now the, the common theme for both of these is that kinetic energy increases by the square of the speed. As you know, the equation for a kinetic energy is one half m times the speed squared and one half mv squared. So if you double the speed, you quadruple the kinetic energy. If you triple the speed, the kinetic energy goes up by a factor of nine because it's always the speed squared. Um, now, since the kinetic energy increases by uh, V squared, that means that the braking distance does too. And I know you saw this in the videos, but I just want to review that idea very, very briefly here. Um, that looks like a good place for me. Okay, so brakes uh, produce constant braking force. Uh, they work by friction. And uh, we've looked at friction before. Uh, and as you know, that uh, once the friction um, gets up to a certain level, it can't increase anymore. Then you go to sliding friction, uh, and sliding friction just is what it is. So uh, you're going to get your max performance from braking if you are just not quite sliding the tires. That means you have the maximum static friction, and that's the most force that the brakes can produce because it depends on the uh, coefficient of friction, which is just a characteristic of the brake material, and the normal force, which is the weight of the car. And since neither one of those things is changing, the max braking force will always be the same no matter how fast you're going. Okay, so brakes do work, which means that they use the work equation here. The work that the brakes does is force times distance. So brakes do work on the car. Uh, they apply a force, basically a friction force between the car and the road, which is applied over a distance as the car is traveling down the road trying to slow down. So, yeah, the work equation absolutely applies. Uh, and the, this process of braking force transforms the car's kinetic energy into thermal energy. It heats up the brakes. Uh, if the car is skidding, well, then it's heating up the tires and it's heating up the road surface. But that doesn't work as well as if you can keep the energy in the brakes. Um, okay, so that means that if a car is going twice the speed, it's going to have four times the kinetic energy. And that means that the brakes need four times the distance to stop the car because the work they do is transforming kinetic energy into thermal energy. And they can only do force times distance. If the force doesn't change, that means that the distance has to, has to change. And if you have four times the work to be done, it's going to take four times the distance. Likewise, if you have three times the speed, that means you have nine times the kinetic energy, and that's going to give you nine times the stopping distance. Now, this is relevant for physics uh, because it's, you know, it's an interesting quirk of kinetic energy, but it also is relevant for your everyday life because this tells you why speeding is not a good idea. You know, they say speed kills. It really does. Um, if you are driving through a neighborhood um, and you're driving at the speed limit, 25 miles per hour, you can stop very quickly. The reason that the, uh, the speed limit is 25 miles per hour in residential areas is because most cars can stop in time uh, to keep from hitting a child that runs out into the street. You can see him coming and get on the brakes and stop. Um, and being young, you guys have lightning quick reflexes, so you might say, hey, I can drive faster, and I'll still be able, I'll be able to get on the, the brakes faster than a than, than an old person who teaches physics. Um, but that doesn't do you any good. Uh, it doesn't do you much good, I should say, because you don't stop in twice the distance. If you're going twice as fast, you stop in four times the distance. So if you're going 50 in a residential area, you're not gonna stop in, uh, uh, you're not gonna stop in time, if, even if your uh, reflexes are quick and you're paying extra close attention. Okay, so um, likewise, if you're, uh, driving in fog or in snowy conditions, um, you got to slow down because uh, um, when you can see the stopped car ahead of you in the fog, if you're driving fast, you're not going to be able to stop in time. 
because going a little bit faster uh, makes you makes your uh, stopping distance much more. Okay. Watch your speed. Okay, now this one is uh, is more academic. This is more about just straight physics. Um, but um, since kinetic energy increases by the square of the speed, this also means that a car engine cannot produce constant acceleration. Okay. Um, now you may or may not have noticed this or been con conscious of this, but if you think about it, it's true. Um, cars accelerate more gradually the faster they're going. And you see this in races on TV and in TV shows and, and all sorts of places, and even in your own experience, if you're trying to accelerate quickly to get onto the freeway or something like that. The faster you're going, the more gradually your speed increases. The acceleration drops off as your speed goes up. Um, and that's not a flaw of the engine. It's not because of air resistance or anything like that. It's because of the nature of kinetic energy. So, for example, here, this is real data that I got from the manufacturer uh, off the Internet, so it must be true. A, a Corvette ZR1 accelerates from 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds. That's, frankly, excessive. No legal car needs to do that, but, hey, why not? Um, people do this on closed tracks, so why not? Uh, and it, the same car can accelerate from 0 to 120, which is twice the speed, but it takes 10 seconds to do it. So another way to say that is that it goes from 0 to 60 in 3.4 seconds, and then the next 60 miles an hour from 60 to 120 takes basically twice as long, 6.6 seconds. Um, well, this is because a car going 120 miles per hour doesn't have twice as much energy as one going 60. It has four times as much kinetic energy because kinetic energy goes by V squared. Um, so it's actually kind of surprising here. And well, I'm going to have you do the math um, uh, that the time is what it is. Uh, so I'm, we're going to switch over to the document camera here. And I want you to figure out... Um, the amount of energy that a car has when it's going 60 and compare that to the amount of energy that it has when it's going 120. We'll actually plug some numbers in, into this and see what it is. Um, okay, so zero to 60 in 3.4 seconds, um, zero to 120 in 10 seconds. And uh, so we wanna find out the change in kinetic energy from zero to 60 and the change in kinetic energy from 60 to 120. Okay. Now the equation we're going to use for this is one half mv squared because that's what kinetic energy is. And for convenience, we're going to assume a lightweight car. We can actually ignore the mass entirely if we do the right math tricks, but I think it's a little easier to see if we do apply a, uh, um, a mass. So we're going to say that we have a very lightweight Corvette with a mass of two kilograms, because that'll make the mass math fairly easy. Okay, so um, the Ke at zero, MPH equals zero, and then the kinetic energy at sixty, and um, yeah, we're going to just call this unit, so that's fine, is equal to one-half times two times 60 squared. And that comes out to be 3,600 joules, because 60 squared is 3,600. Okay, now the uh, kinetic energy at 120 is going to be one-half times two times 120 squared. That one I can't do in my head. So we're going to do 120 x squared. Well, I guess I could have done that one. Equals 14,400 joules. Really, it's not joules; it's units. But that's we'll we'll go with it anyway. Um, all right. So that means that the change in kinetic energy from 60 to 120 is going to be 1,440 minus 3,600 which equals 10,800 joules. All right, so from zero to 60, we gain 3,600 joules. From 60 to 100, we gain 10,800 joules. And we can see that this is three times the energy. Three times the energy in twice the time. 
And that might be a little bit surprising. Let's talk power. The power that the, uh, that the en engine produces is 3,600 pseudo joules here in 3.4 seconds. And that is equal to one thousand and sixty watts and the power that the engine produces during the the uh, the second phase here is going to be ten thousand eight hundred joules divided by um let's see it was six point six seconds divided by six point six is sixteen uh sixteen hundred watts sixteen hundred watts okay so even though the engine is producing more power, the acceleration is reduced. Now, you might be wondering, well, how come the, uh, why the difference here? Uh, well, the reason is because the car is already rolling when it gets to uh, miles per hour, and it's not rolling uh, when it's at zero. Um, and the way a car works, some of, you, some of you know how a car works and some of you don't. There's an engine up front, which when it's running, it's always spinning. Uh, and then there's the wheels at the back, which sometimes they're spinning and sometimes they're not. Um, and in between those two, there's a thing called the transmission, which literally transmits the energy from the engine back to the wheels. Um, now, if an engine is not turning, it stops working. So that means that when you start a car from a standstill, start moving from a standstill, there's a period of time there where the engine is turning and the wheels are not. And when you step on the gas pedal or engage the drive to start moving the car forward there's a period of time where there has to be some sliding somewhere in the transmission where um, it uh, is kind of slowly squeezing the uh, the engine together with the wheels to start dragging the wheels along and making start moving but there has to be a period where there's some sliding in there and during that sliding you just have friction and you're heating up the transmission um, also, car engines produce more power when they're spinning faster. This is why high RPM engines produce more power than low RPM engines. And race cars run at very high RPMs. They run them at a speed just short of making the engine fly apart because it's spinning too fast. They go very close to the red line because that's, uh, that's when it's producing the most power. So you see this here. Uh, you lose some, uh, some energy accelerating from zero and also once you're moving the car is moving kind of slow and the engine can't spin spin very fast so it can't produce a whole lot of energy so at low speeds the car is not very efficient and it's not producing very much power now when you get up to 60 miles per hour and beyond now the engine can be spinning very fast high rpms lots of power and you have much less sliding in the transmission anyway so that's uh, that's why you get this uh, this kind of strange result um, the acceleration is much quicker at low speeds than high speeds, even though the power output is lower at low speeds and higher at high speeds. But it's because kinetic energy goes by the square of the speed uh, and the engine is adding energy to the car to make it go faster and faster. It's just the same amount of energy doesn't have as much effect on the change in speed the faster the car goes. Okay. So, hope you found that mildly interesting, and uh, that's what we have for today. We'll let